Hi, in this episode I'll be talking to Dr. Alice Horton, an anthropogenic contaminant scientist with the National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton. <laughs> what a mouthful that is. So over a brew, Alice tells me about how she investigates the accumulation, behaviour and ecological effects of microplastics in the aquatic environment. Do you fancy a brew? Hiya. Hi. I'm just having some technical difficulties. Can you bear with me two minutes? Yeah, sure. Because I've got a notepad that I can't find anywhere with all oh, no. the, all my research that I've done on you and how we're going to talk about you know this this topic. And now I can't find it anywhere. I don't want to miss something that I've perhaps thought of to ask you and talk about. So are you okay for a second or yeah. two? Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, sure. Obviously. Got it. Where was it? Yeah, at the side of my bed. <laughs> we. Why it would be there, I have no idea. Matthew Holton introduced us, I think. It was on Twitter. Do you know him? I don't um, actually know. No. So, so I basically did a bit of a reach out a while ago, specifically for someone like yourself to talk about this, this subject we're going to come on to. Yep. Um, and, and Matty said, uh, oh, you need to speak to her. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I reached out to you. We had a bit of a conflab back and forth to try and see where we were going and what we were going to do. And here we are, yep. right now, on a Monday night, when we could be doing something better, like having dinner. <laughs> but yep. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. So if you can give us a bit of an intro to who you are, what you're about, not too many spoilers, and then yep. we'll, see, we'll see how we get on, where we can go with it. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really interesting that somebody introduced us on Twitter who I don't actually know, because that, that's quite cool to know that people are hearing about my work without me actually having met them. so yeah. yeah that's that's nice for me um so my name as you said is dr alice horton i work at the national oceanography center in southampton uh, and my job title is anthropogenic contaminant scientist um so what that means essentially is that i look at human derived contaminants and human derived pollution within the environment um and i've been looking at pollution i would say for the last six or seven years as a job um but my main area over that time has been plastic pollution, and that's what I'm really focusing on now. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad I asked you how to pronounce that, and then I don't have to now. <laughs> Anthro <laughs> anthropogenic contaminants. Got it, Anna? I'm all over it. Yes, yeah, first time. So leading up to you finishing university, doing your PhD and that, well before that, did you have an, o an ocean sort of interest? And if so, what led you into that sort of direction? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I would say that for me, science came before the ocean specifically. Like I've always been interested in science and I've always asked a lot of questions and I wanted to know how things were. I was probably one of those annoying children who was always like, why, why, how does that work? Tell me more. And, you know, like to the point where I think even adults couldn't answer my questions and I was like, well, if I they don't identify know, I have to find that. out myself. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly that yeah. child. I was and probably yeah. still am to some degree, that child. Yeah. <laughs> I think I still have. I still ask those questions, but a lot of the time people don't know the answers, but that's fine. That's what research is all about, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, I was always interested in science. And for me, it was mostly about biology. So I was interested in, in living things and how they worked and where they lived and why they lived in certain areas and what affects them and that sort of thing. So my first degree was in biology. That's, that's the first place I went to. And I think it was mainly that I didn't really know what I wanted to do as a career. Right. I just thought, right, I'm just going to pick something that I think is interesting, that I'm going to get stuck into, and I'm just going to see where it takes me. Ace. So yeah. when, what is the definition then of an, oh, come on, just say it, anthropogenic contaminant? What's the definition of that? So it's anything that is within the environment that's been introduced by humans that, that shouldn't be there, essentially. So we could say... Um, that's the case about a lot of, of chemicals like uh, pesticides, herbicides, and synthetic chemicals that have been manufactured. Yeah. Um, we could also say about plastics, of course, which is, mm. is my area that I look at a lot. So, yeah, something that, that's, that's come from human activities. It's funny you should say that, uh, and we're talking about this, because last night, I, I, as a bit of an amateur photo underwater photographer, I follow quite a lot of Facebook groups to try and get some inspiration. And there was a hermit crab inside the lid of um, like a juice or water, you know, like a, you buy your, your spring water from the shop or whatever. I don't want to say any yeah. brands because you never know. 
yeah. of them might want to sponsor me one day and realise that I've fobbed <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. Um, but nonetheless, it was like the lid that you, you know, like the flip cap that you squirt in your mouth and then flick it back down. One of them, but a hermit yeah. crab was living in the lid. What a shame oh, that is. It was a, yeah, it was a good so photograph sad. for what it was, but because it, it was showing off the fact that there's yeah. a lot of crap that we're dumping in the ocean. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, talking again about contaminants, um, I guess another thing you could say about contaminants is that generally they're things that are not natural. So you could distinguish between contaminants and pollutants by saying that pollutants, a pollutant is something that's in the wrong place, basically. So it could be oil, but you can also have things like noise pollution, light yeah. pollution. So it, it could be something that's natural. It's just in the wrong place at the right at the wrong time. Right. Whereas a contaminant would be something more that is is synthetic and abnormal, I guess you could say. So it's always going to be in the wrong place because it was never meant to be there really yeah. anyway. I suppose it's good to distinguish from that from the off and then we can we can go down the avenue of, of one rather than the other. Well, at least I, yeah. look, I look cleverer now. I'm not going to go down the wrong avenue. That's where we're probably better at. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so my, my initial interpretation on a conversation I had on this podcast a while ago was one of two things. So either a washing solution that used to have the little microbeads in, so it was yeah. already small particles of plastic, or, for instance, like my pen, you know, it'd get disposed of, and over time, through pressure and, and, and whatnot, it would break up and just become smaller pieces. But yeah. still, you could distinguish that it was a bit of blue plastic that my pen was made of. And probably you'd see it on a beach or something somewhere through whatever reason. But my yeah. my eyes were opened, um, like I said to you before, when I spoke to Autumn from Stream to Sea, that a lot of the gelling agents, especially in stuff that we're using now, like hand sanitizers, the more runny that is, clearly the better it is for the environment because it's not containing all these gelling agents that are in some form or other a microplastic. But I didn't know that. I was almost like, wow. And to be fair, the runnier ones are nicer because they just evaporate and your hands dead quick. Whereas the jelly ones, you're like, get off me, claggy hands. It's minging, isn't it? Yeah. It's a really, it's an interesting distinction and one that I've been asked about before, yeah. uh, especially by people in industry who are manufacturing products like this. Mm. Um, so, you know, where do we draw the line about what's the microplastic and what isn't? Because a lot of, like you've said, a lot of what's used in these products are what are called semi-soluble polymers, um, which means that they're not a solid form, but they're still a synthetic polymer in itself. Right. Um, so I would say that, is a little out of the area of microplastics and it's not something that I focus on specifically uh, mainly because it becomes more difficult to look at you can't handle it like you can with a particle right. essentially you know it's a liquid and it dissolves you know as you mix it with water it gets more and more liquid until it just dissolves. Mm -hmm. We were um, at the beginning of September we went up to the west coast of Scotland to an island called Col and we were, it was supposed to be a basking shark research trip so we're going to take water samples, DNA samples and photographic samples and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, the Hurricane Laura came in or the back end of it, you know, this unsurvivable one that they had on the east coast yeah. of America and everyone had to move and all the rest of it. So we got the tail end of that. So the water was really choppy and we didn't see anything. But what interested me is the conversation we had when we had one of the lectures that as they are filter feeders and they've got these gill rakers, that all these particles could quite easily get stuck in these gill rakers and when, then when they swallow, they, there's no real distinction between the particulate that they'd be trying to eat and the microplastics that are there that shouldn't be. What are they? What are they doing? Why are they not sinking? I don't know. Give us a bit more. Yeah, so um, microplastics are quite an interesting contaminant to work on in the sense that people hear the word microplastics and they think of it as being just one thing. Yeah. But it's a bit of a misconception because really it's a lot of different things. So... You think about plastic, for example, like the plastic that you use day to day, you've got uh, plastic bottles, plastic bags, you know, your computer, loads of stuff around your house. They're all different and they're all made of different types of plastic. They all feel different, they all look different and they all have different purposes. Uh, and as those things break down, you've mentioned it already about plastics mm. breaking down. Uh, that's the, the main source of microplastics in the environment is the breakdown of larger items they will all behave differently and they will go to different places. Some of them will sink, some of them will float because they all have different densities. So it becomes very difficult to say, 
this is what microplastics will do because it depends very much on the particles that you're looking at and what environment you're in and how long they've been there and how they got there and so many different things. Yeah. It's, it's, obviously, it's a massive interest to us as scuba divers. There's a lot of groups out there, whether it be Sea Shepherd or Ghost Nets UK or whatever they call them. They go out and retrieve bits of leftover fishing tackle, you know, whether it be a net or some lines and all this sort of stuff, and bring them in. And then they're recycling them to make T-shirts now. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of struggle with that a little bit because clearly I, I understand why you take these net or lobster pops or whatever it might be out of the sea because stuff will be caught in them that shouldn't be, you know, unintentional catch. Yeah. But then if you're going to then bring them back and re so, so recycle them and make a t-shirt and then I'm going to put it in my washing machine. Yeah. They're going to break down again, isn't it? So what can we do with these plastics in order to either buy better, recycle differently, not, I, I don't know, buying the right things, I, I suppose. It's the one that's better. Yeah. Than I know there's 20 questions there. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> well, there's quite a big uh, area to cover in that mm -hmm. one question. Um, I think you're right, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, actually, with respect to uh, taking items out of the sea, like ocean plastic, it's quite a big buzzword at the moment, mm -hmm. creating new things out of it. Um, I think a good thing about that is, A, you've mentioned it, A, it takes those items out of the environment. So we know that ghost fishing gear, uh, so fishing gear that's just been left, essentially, to rot in the sea, uh, does capture a lot of organisms. Um, unintentionally that it was never intended for that purpose but they get tangled up um, and then you know a lot of organisms die so I think to take that out of the environment is good like you said if you're then manufacturing fabrics out of it you then get the fibre issue I think something to think about there is is whether you would buy that kind of clothing anyway so I know that a lot of ocean plastic for example is used to make sports gear and sports gear naturally is made of things like nylon and polyester because it's wicking it's fast drying it's the kind of textiles that people like to wear when they're doing sports activities so I think if you're going to buy those kind of clothing items anyway then to buy it made out of something recycled is better than to buy it made out of virgin plastic where it's essentially yeah. been made out of oil that's come out of the ground specifically for making those clothes yeah so you're right there are definitely issues with respect to you know, it's it's stopped being one pollutant, but suddenly it's become another one. <laughs> but equally, it's not going into landfill as well. So it, it is it is a better product. I agree. Exactly. With. I think it's always going to be better to reuse or recycle something if you can. Yeah. Um, and ideally, those things wouldn't have been lost into the ocean in the first place. Yeah. And they could have been reused and reused and reused. Mm. But we know that you know, it's not an ideal world and that doesn't always happen. And fishing gear is a good example of something that's designed to be so resilient that it doesn't break because, you know, you've got these huge trawlers, mm -hmm. even, you know, um, small fishing, fishing boats. They have to put quite a lot of force on those nets and on those lines mm -hmm. to pull them in when they're full of fish. So those items need to be really, really strong and hard wearing. And that mm -hmm. is what becomes a problem if they get lost into the sea, is that they're yeah. th still strong and hard-wearing months and years later. Yeah. You know, that's just still there. Nothing changes, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, what have you sort of found? What have you developed within your role? Um, so I started in my job at the National Oceanography Centre last year in August. Mm -hmm. And before that, I was working uh, at an organisation called the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, um, so the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, also known as CEH, is more of a freshwater and terrestrial research institute, uh, whereas uh, National Oceanography Centre, or NOC, is more of a marine and ocean-based research institute. So you could say I've kind of gone from land down rivers to the sea, <laughs> flowing <laughs> with the water, um, and most of my research has been aquatic focused, right. so within water bodies. But because I spent a lot of years working for a, a research institute that wasn't specifically marine focused, I've been looking a lot at rivers yeah. uh, and especially with respect to plastics and microplastics, what is entering rivers in terms of microplastics? Where are they going? Where are they accumulating? And then what are the ecological effects of those? And now that I'm at NOC, 
I'm using that that knowledge and that research and sort of developing it also still to look at fresh waters but to look also more at estuaries and oceans yeah. and how those pieces of plastic are coming from the land through the rivers and into the oceans and then what are the effects of them when they get there so it, it's quite broad I would say I've done yeah. quite a lot of different things <laughs> so is, is that where you started your PhD then what you talked about from the more terrestrial based stuff um, so it was more freshwater, so river based. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I actually, um, so I don't know if you were going to ask me this now, but I'm going to go into it anyway. Go on, do it. <laughs> um, uh, so my, I guess you could say my pathway to academia was a bit unusual in that I started in a research job before I had a PhD, which is not all that common. Okay. Um, where I was working before at CEH. And then I started doing a PhD part time alongside that job, which yeah. was reflecting very well the research that I was doing already. So I was already starting to work on microplastics. Some of my colleagues suggested that I did a PhD on microplastics to work alongside that job. And so I got my PhD part time uh, while I was at my last organisation. But the university that I was with was in the Netherlands. Uh, so it was Leiden University yeah. in the Netherlands. So it meant although I was based in the UK, I would go over and work in the Netherlands now and again. So I made some really good connections over there. So it worked out really well for me in that I was working and doing my PhD at the same time. I don't know how well that would work for everybody because obviously it's quite full on <laughs> doing that. Yeah. But for me, I felt like I was really properly immersed in it, you know, nice. so I really enjoyed that. Yeah. All right. Let's test how immersed you were. Do you speak Dutch? Or did you have to learn to speak Dutch? <laughs> or did no, you... and I feel like that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, the Dutch are so good at speaking English. And, you know. <laughs> yes, I like it. Oh, yeah. that's brilliant. Dutch is a difficult language. Yeah. Say. I think that's kind of common knowledge. But yeah, I, I think if I was living there, it would have been different and I would have made more effort. Yeah. But because I went there, I went to work with you know, Dutch people, but English speaking collaborators, yeah. like the language of science really is English, I would yeah. say, it's of, you know, academic publications, going to yeah. conferences. If you want to talk to people all around the world, generally people do that in English. So yeah, it, it works well being an English person, obviously. <laughs> and I have immense respect for anybody who does English as a second language. And well, it does any career, but you know, science especially, where you've got so much jargon going on, to be able to do that as your second language, yeah. I, I don't know how people do it. Really. <laughs> I spoke to um, a guy called Jake a couple of weeks ago. He's a marine biologist, lives in Wales. His first language was Welsh, or they had to, I think it was up to, I want to say year 10 at school. Yeah. Had to do it. Um, and it, my, my question to him was, what language do you think in? Yeah. Because that really baffles me, that, and, and interests me as well. And he said, um, it depends what I'm thinking about. So if I'm doing it, in, <laughs> if I'm thinking about my maths question, yeah, yeah. straight away it's into Welsh. But pretty yeah. much everything is English. Because it's a, a weird thing to think about, isn't it? You, you don't actually say the words out loud in your head as such. No. But could you contemplate that if you went to another country and you predominantly just spoke that language and forgot English as such, as in you never use it, wonder how your brain ticks over, whether it be your dreams. I know it's going really far-fetched and I don't yeah. always do this. It was just one of them. So yeah. with your PhD, did you have a, a specific question to try and answer and did you answer it? So I wouldn't say that I had one question. I had a number of questions. So when I started uh, researching microplastics it was in 2014 yeah it's, I'd say it's quite a new research field like when I started very little had been done really and especially in fresh waters which was, is where I was starting to do the research so there were so many questions that you could have asked that I actually started quite basic so I started by asking are there microplastics in UK freshwater systems. This is something that nobody had looked at at that point. Yeah. So I started by doing um, field work, like surveys in rivers around the UK to see if I could find microplastics and if I could find them, what did they look like? Where were they coming from? How many were there? Where were they accumulating? Yeah. Um, and that was really interesting because I had assumed, I think as a lot of people assume in this field or have assumed for a while that 
the majority of microplastics derive from wastewater because you know wastewater treatment isn't necessarily designed for microplastics mm. um it filters stuff out but it wasn't specifically designed for plastics um we know that a lot of microplastics are in wastewater with respect to personal care products cosmetics laundry with the microfibers like you've mentioned yeah. But what I found actually is that although there was some influence of wastewater in those areas, I actually also saw a lot of influence from uh, just land drainage. So um, storm drains, which release um, city runoff, you could say, into rivers. And I found a lot of fragments from roads, like pieces of uh, road marking paints really? and things that I just hadn't expected to find. No. Um, and road marking paints often have a thermoplastic kind of base to them because they're applied to the road as a liquid and then they solidify yeah. um, so essentially a piece of paint can also be considered to be a piece of plastic yeah. and that was something that I wasn't really expecting to mm -hmm. find um, cool. and you know when I found them it was it was quite a surprise so that was cool because no one had really looked at that before or found it so that's when you feel like you're doing real research is when you find something that you didn't even intend to find yeah. <laughs> um, and then moving on from that, I wanted, because like I said, my background was more in biology. So I wanted to look at more like what are the effects of plastics, yeah. are organisms interacting with them? So I did a study looking at fish in the River Thames, and looking at ingestion of, of microplastics by fish. Um, and I found in that study that uh, one third of the fish that I examined had at least one plastic particle within their gut. Um, and around 75% of those were fibres. So again, we're wow. seeing this really heavy load from microfibers, yeah. um, suggesting a, a sort of wastewater input, but also we know now that there can be a lot of microplastics, um, microfibers as well, especially deposited uh, through the air, so atmospheric deposition to land or to water. So that's not something I specifically investigated in that study, but in hindsight, you know, those things, it's, it's dust, essentially, yeah. that's in the air around you. So... Those were the first two studies which are more field-based and then from there I went on to do more lab-based uh, ecotoxicological studies so looking at what are the effects of plastics on specific invertebrates and how do those plastics interact with chemicals if you put them into a solution um, in the same place at the same time with these organisms does the plastic change the toxicity of the chemical to the organism because there's been a lot of hypotheses about how plastics will bind chemicals within the environment, which could yeah. change the toxicity of the chemicals, making them more or less toxic to the right. organism. Um, so yeah, that uh, kind of that was interesting in the sense that I wasn't looking for toxicity of plastics alone, I was looking for toxicity of an association, and it's very difficult to pull apart. <laughs> um, but I guess I could say there didn't seem to be that much of an interaction between the plastic and the right. chemicals, which is, is kind of contrary to what a lot of people say mm. or think that plastics and chemicals will associate with each other and change the way in which organisms interact with them. So we know that plastics have a lot of chemicals incorporated into them, and that's kind of a different question that I didn't tackle there. So for me, that, I would say, is probably one of the most interesting next questions is, what about the chemicals that are built into plastics like dyes and plasticizers, uh, flame retardants and so on that are kind of inherently in those plastics when they're manufactured? We know once they get into the environment, they leach out, they kind of disappear. <laughs> um, so what implications does that have for toxicity to organisms? Wow, deep stuff this. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I'm mightily impressed. I, I, I didn't think we'd get into it this deep. And that's purely on an ignorance of myself. You know, I'm not, and this is why I do this. I want to learn. You know, I want, I want yeah. a better understanding. You know, that wasn't too much detail, was it? No, no, I, I, I followed you throughout, which is surprising because yeah. normally I'm so engrossed in you or the next question. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just like nodding away and I've been asked a question from my guest. So I'm the well there to yeah. follow you. <laughs> So your so, original question was whether I had one question for my yeah. PhD, and I would say not really, because I had yeah. so many questions. There were yeah. so many open questions that I wanted to just answer all of them. Yeah, that's Obviously, good. that's not possible, <laughs> but I had a good stab at it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt this episode to drop another plug for my Patreon account. 
but I do spend a good seven or eight hours producing, editing and launching each episode of this podcast and sometimes days on the production of my YouTube videos. So to help keep this content strong and valuable to you, I'm asking that you become a sponsor and a patron of the Are You A Scooby Diver Fancy A Brew podcast. When you become a supporter, not only will you have my undying appreciation for helping support the podcast, but you'll be able to take advantage of some of the many tiered benefits that come with it, some of which includes official merchandise. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, then visit www.patreon.com forward slash fancy a brew. There you'll see all the different levels of subscription and how to join the Fancy A Brew community. So without further ado, let's get back to the episode. So if you hadn't watched, assuming you have watched it, David Attenborough's yeah. little film he's put on recently, would yeah. you suggest we're all doomed? Um, that's a, it's a difficult one. I wouldn't probably put it that that hard as saying we're all doomed because I'm quite an optimistic person and I like to think we can make things better. Um, it depends if you're talking about plastic or just general humanity <laughs> well let's stick to the topic of, of yeah. plastic in general i mean like if you if you do any listening to anything as a lay person such as myself it just does sound like everything is just ruined already yeah. with regards to everything in the world you know whether it be wars or famines or wealth or politics or the environment everything seems like we've just had such a massive impact on it that it's almost too late, is it, do you think? Um, I don't think it's too late to change and prevent things from getting a lot worse. Mm. I think, to some extent, there's no going back from a lot of what we've done. Yeah. Um, so if we are thinking about plastic, we've got so much in the environment. So there's a statistic that I, I've written down, <laughs> um, which is that since plastic started being produced, um, 8.3 billion tonnes of plastic have been produced in the time since plastic began, you could say. Yeah. Um, and around 79% of that is either in landfills or it's just in the general environment. Yeah. So that's, you know, billions of tonnes of so plastic that's just out in the environment. And we know that we keep putting it in and the amount that we keep putting in is growing. And that's because the amount that we keep producing is growing. So even though people are very aware of plastic use and becoming more aware and a lot of people are trying to reduce the amount that they use and consume, that actually hasn't changed the way that the industries are manufacturing and using plastic. Um, so, you know, you can say, oh, well, this organisation's changed to different types of bottle or we've now got, you know, different types of material, but actually we know that the amount of plastic that's being produced is, is massively increasing. Um, and the trouble with what's in the environment is that we know that it doesn't go away on any like meaningful time scale. So what is there, what has ever been put into the environment will still be there and it will probably still be there in hundreds of years time. But the trouble is that, like you've said, and I've said already, that plastic continues to degrade and it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces mm. to the point where you've started with one plastic bottle and then you've got you know a few million small microplastic particles that just came from one bottle and if you think that of all the large litter that's out there in the environment that's you know billions and billions and trillions of particles yeah. that are just out there in the environment and to some extent that's why cleanup operations are a thing because you know that once you've taken it out of the environment it's not going to just stay there and degrade forever mm -hmm. but at the same time that's not a solution because, you know, if you've got a few billion tons already in the environment, there's no way that we're ever going to be able to collect all of that, no matter how hard we try. So it's about trying to manage what we can at this point in time and try and prevent so much from getting into the environment. And whose responsibility that is, is a really is a difficult question, because as consumers, uh, there are certain things we can do, but there's only so much we can do. You know, we're not global conglomerates we, we don't have the power to make things differently but we do have the power to say actually I'm going to stop buying that or I'm going to do this differently because you know demand does drive the way in which things are manufactured yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting one of the points you made there about cleanup operations so as the two early when we first started chatting we yeah. dived a site in at Lake Windermere at the weekend that was for me 
I've never seen so much rubbish. A lot of it was glass. Um, I want to say aluminium cans, plastic bottles, plastic shoes. There's a lot of shoes. Obviously, it was an area that people perhaps went swimming in and jumped in. So maybe that's why they were losing them. I don't know. Um, but it was a jetty at the back of a hotel. And um, we've, we've contemplated doing a bit of a clean-up. But my, yeah. whilst I'm more than happy to do it, it's, my question to you would be, where do I put it? And the reason I'm asking that is our council, as I'm sure yours does, we have got several different wheelie bins for several, diff several different things. And the recycling one for plastics, glasses and cans are so specific <laughs> That if you were to put the wrong thing in, I'm told it just the whole bin wagon all goes just straight into landfill. So if if there's one item in there that's wrong, they don't have the time or interest to pick it out. They just put it straight into landfill, and then I've I've heard horror stories about it shipped off to like Southeast Asia, and then they just put it in the rivers and it ends up in the sea. So if I went and did this litter pick in Lake Windermere and collected all these cans and different things that were in there, and a few of us did that, what would you suggest yeah. the best thing to do is with that? I think it depends on how long it looks like it's been there, which is, is an easy thing to say and probably less easy to, say, <laughs> to see <laughs> to when you're there. But, you know, if it looks clean and new and it's a plastic bottle, then you could put that in the recycling. If it looks like it's been there for weeks and it's got stuff growing on it and it's all starting to fall apart, you would have to put that in the bin. Right. Because, uh, you know, like with your home recycling, you're supposed to wash food containers before you put them in the recycling. Because if it's got all bits of food on it, then they won't recycle it. It's the same sort of thing if something's been in the environment. And I think if you're not sure, then to just put it in the bin in landfill is going to be the best option. And it doesn't feel very satisfactory putting stuff in landfill. I know that, but I think it's still better than it just being sort of floating around in the lake because then at least it is being managed and it's being contained somewhere mm -hmm. like I guess landfill is a different issue as that you know how that works in the future when everything fills up but uh, yeah I don't know how we deal with that mm -hmm. I like to think of good. landfill as being our future coal mines but it's not really yeah. our future is it it's going to be in like a million years <laughs> yeah <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, if I yeah. try and put a positive spin on what landfill is, that's how I try and justify it, that it's, it's a necessary evil and one day it'll benefit someone, hopefully. Yeah, if anyone's so, <laughs> so what, what I know we've kind of touched on what we can do, but what can we do that's better short of what we've touched on then? How can we help clean it up? Um, I mean, it's, it's about, as a, at a personal level, it's just about choosing which things you can't do without and which things you will be willing to do without so you know there are easy swaps that you can make for plastics like take a reusable water bottle take your own coffee cup you know don't buy lots of new synthetic clothes if you can wear stuff you've already got yeah. um but it is difficult because of the society that we live in and the options that we're given actually a lot of the time you're not given the choice to do the right thing you know if you go to a large supermarket, for example, you might be able to buy your apples loose. Whereas if you go to the small corner shop, they might only have them in plastic bags. Yeah. So you're like, is it better for me to get in my car and drive to a large supermarket and, you know, use up some of my carbon footprint <laughs> to yeah. do that? Or is it better for me to walk to the corner shop and get some apples in a plastic bag? There are so many kind of dilemmas when you're yeah. trying to do the right thing environmentally that... I think you just have to pick the things that you can do and that, you know, you feel kind of comfortable about doing yeah. and do those. But I think for every person, it's going to be different. I think to the people who, who are trying to do plastic free lifestyles, you know, I salute them. I think it's not a viable option for the majority of the population because it, it's so time consuming <laughs> for one to go to all the shops where you can buy these loose items and sometimes it's it's just not feasible. It's you know it can be more expensive and yeah. so on. So yeah, it's difficult to pinpoint what's the thing. Um, as well, there are things you know like if you want to put pressure on 
government, for example, you could write to your local MP and say, you know, can we have a drinking water fountain in the local shopping centre so that I can take my water bottle yeah. when I go there and not have to buy one. So there are small things that you can do like that. And I think pressure does add up, whether it's at industry or policy level. Mm. The more that people talk about things and the more that people start, you know, changing yeah. the way that they're doing things, the more that these people at higher levels will start to listen. Mm. But I think it I think the ball is starting to roll, but, you know, it needs to keep rolling and it needs to gain momentum yeah. for anything to happen. Definitely needs to find a much steeper slope quickly, doesn't it? And just yeah. Keep going. <laughs> well, it's interesting that yeah. because one of the, the sort of bigger brands at the minute, which is a brand through Scooby Diamond, it's called Fourth Element. They're based down in um, Falmouth in Cornwall. And their packaging now is all paper bags. You know, the little yeah. tags that you normally have in with loads of bits of card on telling you how to wash it and all the rest of it. They're not. The stickers. I think yeah yeah the stickers um and they've started this thing called uh, mission 2020 which has not gone quite to plan like anybody's 2020 yeah but they when they initially rolled <laughs> they were it out, doomed from the start <laughs> yeah yeah when they initially rolled it out it was all their branding on it but what they've tried to do is all the other big hitters within the scuba diving um industry they've tried to reach out and say we can help you to get more like this, you know, the, the material that they're using is either 100% cotton or recycled ocean plastics that we talked about earlier. And I'll be honest, when they came, a lot of the t-shirts I wear for work would be quite heavy knit because I do quite a physical job. So I want them to last more than a couple of weeks. And when these came, they were really thin. And I'm thinking, oh, I've just paid a little bit extra and they're a bit thin, they're not going to last me five minutes. But then when you look into the detail of what they're made of and how they feel, oh, now this is just a cheap cotton 10 quid t-shirt. Yeah. Um, but these, they're, they're actually a really nice fabric to wear, you know, that's yeah. not like your, your stereotypical sports fabric like we talked about earlier on. So yeah. within that industry, which is why we're talking, because it's scuba related for what I do, it's good to see that they're having this effect where these single-use plastics, like your plastic bags that you get on your bananas, we just buy bananas from Aldi now with no bag on. Because yeah. what do you need it for? You're just going to pick a bunch up and, and put them in your bag that you, that's a, a bag for life. So you don't need a bag for them. Yeah. Because it's stuck I together, aren't they? That is kind of the way that sustainability should work and has to work, is that... You, you buy less, basically. You consume less. Mm. So what you have and what you buy should last and it should do its job properly so that you don't want or need to replace it really quickly. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because of the way, you know, society is quite consumeristic and you're always being sold stuff. Yeah. It's kind of hard to avoid that. Even, you know, even the eco brands, they have adverts, you know, on social media where you're scrolling through and you're like, oh, I could get a nice new jumper. And you're like, hang on, I don't actually need a new jumper. Yeah. I've just been reeled in just because it's a new eco <laughs> jumper. It doesn't mean yes. I actually need a new jumper. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely very easy to get like lured into these things. Mm. Well, <laughs> a, a perfect example of that is printer cartridge ink. How yeah. expensive is printer cartridge ink? You can go and buy a brand new printer, scanner, faxer, whatever the flipping X in it, for the yeah. same price as the two cartridges of ink that come with it. Yeah. And if it doesn't meet your requirements for your decoration, you just go and throw it in the bin and get a new one, don't you? Well, that's what people... Yeah. I remember someone saying, it's a disposable society we live in. What a yeah. horrible term that is. Yeah, but we were actually sold it, so there's this amazing... Um, article that was published in Life magazine, I think it was in the 50s or 60s, it was when plastic was really first developed yeah. and it was selling this throwaway lifestyle so the image on it is like a family just throwing loads of items up into the air and the tagline on it basically says um, now you don't need to do any housework or washing up because you just use it once and then you throw it away and this wow. was like their whole selling point and yeah. um, it was really funny, actually, because it was all about the housewife. It was like, now your wife doesn't need to do any more washing up. <laughs> Could you imagine that, that nowadays? I know. You'd be an uproar, wouldn't that? Yeah, oh. yeah. So, you know, back then, I think it was seen as a solution, definitely. And, you know, mm. plastic has been a solution to so many things. When we think of, you know, the leaps and bounds that have come on in technology and medical science mm. and all sorts because of the use of plastic and the fact that you can make it sterile, you know, we need it for certain purposes 
but yeah, you don't need disposable cutlery just so you don't have to do the washing up at home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are levels on there. Yeah, where, where did we go the other day? Oh, we had, um, while we were in Windermere, we went for a cream tea after we've been diving, as you do. Scone was yeah. about three foot tall with cream, oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> but it came in, in, a car, in a really nice sort of cardboard tray, but with um, your sort of bamboo, you know, knife and fork, which I thought was brilliant. You know, I really did yeah. like that. Um, but then equally, we've seen a bamboo toothbrush. So we bought that for our, my wife's brother, who's um, he's gone all vegan and he's, you know, really gone all the way with that. Mm-hmm. So we bought him one of them, and I've had this discussion a few times. Things like this, like your toothbrushes and your disposable razors. If, if you went into your Tesco's and Asda's, I will name drop these now because they're, they're just the only places you can really go into. You can't go in and buy a bamboo toothbrush. They're all plastic. Well, they were yeah. last time I went in, which was a couple of weeks ago. But yeah. our consumer power, we can't change that because if the option isn't there, so we're perhaps short of writing to them and saying, is there an option, a th- like a second option rather than the plastic ones? So it's a- Yeah, I mean, I think these big retailers, they have to know that the demand is there in order to stock something. And I think if enough people said to them, can you please stock this because I'll actually buy it, then they probably would. But if they don't hear it, then maybe they won't. I mean, I don't exactly know how yeah. their purchasing strategy <laughs> works, but that's that's how I'm imagining. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it seems... It would help. It does seem pretty hard as an individual to make enough of an impact to get that ball rolling faster and faster, we talked about. But I suppose, as Tesco would say, every little helps. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> bringing it back on itself, that. Uh, yeah, exactly. So all isn't doomed. We can just make a little bit of an impact just by trying to just change a bit of habits, I suppose, is the way we can do it, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I don't like to think that we're all doomed because if you say that, then you're like, well, what's the point? You yeah. might as well just carry on as we are until society collapses. And that is obviously not the way you want to do it. You want to like try and at least, even if you know that things might get worse because we're going to keep putting stuff into the environment yeah. that we shouldn't, you can at least say, well, you know, we'll prolong the good times yeah. as long as we can <laughs> by trying to do things better. And then at some point, somebody might come up with some solution you know like renewable energy as a completely different example but you know and we keep using oil and gas and till there's new technologies and then they take over mm. and it might be similar with with plastics but i think that's going to be quite a long way off yeah. because it's so useful <laughs> for so many applications and you know we all use it every day all the time that's an interesting way of sort of wrapping things up now then something you mentioned then is there anything in the pipeline, not so much to replace plastic, because obviously there's lots of things out there that in some respects would, but to, to make clean up, you know, like filtering it out the water in some respects, is, is there anything that's anywhere near? I think that this might not be the best place to start. I think you've opened a can of worms, really. Oh, because... no. <laughs> <laughs> um, clean up is a difficult one because... It has to be, if you want it to work and you want it to work effectively, it has to be targeted. So what we can't say is we're going to go to the ocean and we're going to filter everything out because then you take out everything that is useful and important in the ocean. So it's not just the plastic, but it's all, like you said, the phytoplankton, zooplankton, all the small organisms that, you know, create the life in the ocean. So you can't go and filter everything out. Um, in some scenarios, it might work. So I know that there's been talk of putting filters on washing machines, for example, mm-hmm. uh, which can capture any synthetic fibres from your laundry load before they get released into the wastewater stream. Yeah. And if that works, um, you know, there's evidence to show that those can be effective. Then you could essentially just, you know, unscrew that filter. Of course, there's the question of what do you do with what's in that filter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, put it in the bin. But um, The recycle bin, the recycle bin. <laughs> well, you can't, yeah, you wouldn't be able to recycle it no. enough. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, clean up operations are a difficult one because you want to be able to clean and make the environment, you know, better and cleaner, but without damaging what's already there. So you can't just bulldoze in and, you know, trawl everything out of the sea. Um, so, you know, in a way, these grassroots operations, litter picking and NGOs, you know, they can actually have a massive impact because it's individuals going out and collecting stuff, which I think 
although it might not seem like it is going to work on a large scale because as soon as you've collected this stuff it washes back up on the beach again yeah like it's still better than doing nothing and if everybody does it every time they go to the beach you know there's things like the two minute beach clean and stuff just to encourage people to say you know it will only take you two minutes it's nothing just mm. collect a few bits and go home if everybody who went to the beach did that it would be you know much cleaner every time yeah. you went so yeah in terms of industrial scale operations that's really difficult to pinpoint mm. but in terms of individual activity i'd say it's it's still definitely worth it i like that the, at least the, there's something that comes out of this if everyone does a little bit maybe it'll just have an impact it's just getting that message out that you need to change the way you a lot of us live i suppose in it definitely and it's it's a very kind of um can't think of the word but it's a society that relies on convenience you know it's the convenience culture mm. so you know you're well at the moment everyone's at home so maybe it's a bit better but you know if you're out working every day you forgot to make a lunch you have to go to the local shop and pick up a sandwich or something packet of crisps yeah. or whatever all of a sudden you've got like a bag of litter in your car just from you know a couple of days worth of lunches so things like that you know if you can if you can just make a sandwich then obviously that's better mm. but it's it, it's saying to people actually you have to change the way you do things you can't just pop out and spend a couple of quid on a sandwich you're going to have to make it at home and <laughs> people don't like being told what to do do they so oh. you have to make them think it's their idea it's like wearing <laughs> masks now isn't it oh i'm not doing it because you've told me i've got to wear a mask exactly come on <laughs> get a grip just wear one yeah and then we wouldn't be so getting I think locked down again yeah i think that's why you have to kind of yeah it's not about telling people what to do and that as, as my role as a scientist is about presenting the evidence so saying to people you know this is what we're seeing in the environment this mm. is the effect that it's having i'm not telling you what you should do about it but you know there are some options you can use these if you want yeah. but it's not for me to judge you about what you do and don't do but you know there, you know, there are things you can do. It's up to you, really. Yeah. Right. One last question. Yeah. Cit the words or the phrase citizen science has come up loads of times in conversations I've had, only through having yeah. this podcast, never before yeah. and never outside of the, these four walls as such have I heard of it. But who are you working with and for now and the projects you're on, is there anything that citizen science gets involved with at all? Citizen science is quite a big thing when it comes to plastics because, like I said, it's so easy for people to go out and, you know, with a litter picker, go to their beach and collect stuff. Um, so there are a lot of survey-based uh, citizen science initiatives that are going on for, for example, counting plastic bottles. There's an organisation called Thames 21 who work along the River Thames, obviously. Um, they do loads of citizen science by getting people to collect litter, but also make a note of what it is. So how many plastic bottles have you got? How many plastic bags have you collected? Yeah. And it seems like it's really basic, but actually it gives really interesting insights into the kind of things that are washing up along the banks of the River Thames. And the more and more people that get to do that, the more and more data they get until actually it becomes quite a big data set. Yeah. And so there are organisations all over the world doing this. And even with, with microplastics, there are a few organisations um, I think it's the big nerdle hunt <laughs> is one of them where they kind of encourage people to go out to beaches and look for microplastics obviously it gets difficult the smaller and smaller particles you look for um but it definitely citizen science gives you a scale of data collection that you don't get as a regular scientist you know i couldn't go out to 100 beaches in one day <laughs> and do surveys but you might have 100 citizen scientists around the world who are doing surveys in one day and they all collect their data and suddenly you've got a massive load so I mean obviously it doesn't work for everything um and like I said with microplastics it gets quite difficult because of the small scale of the particles mm. and are people really finding plastics or are they finding other things that they think look like plastics um but definitely for some applications it can be really valuable so I, I would definitely encourage it mm. I'm just I'm more asking for myself really I like being involved in stuff like this so if there is anything yeah. that comes up, you come up, you go, oh, I need a lad that lives up near Wigan and he goes diving to do anything. <laughs> Give me a shout, okay. will you? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I'm definitely going to bear that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> hey. Well, thanks very much for giving up a bit of your evening tonight. I, I do appreciate it. If, if not for my own learning, but obviously to 
create an episode for my podcast that hopefully will touch a nerve with somebody within the sort of diving community to listen to this and maybe just change them from buying a plastic bag wrapped banana or cucumber, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah so, it's been really nice to chat. Thanks it's, very much. It's nice to talk to people who are like, you know, at the other end of things, you know, I talk yeah. to scientists all day. So. <laughs> Nice to talk to normal people. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been fun, and and like I said, I've learned quite a bit. So yeah. happy days. Awesome. Right, nice right. one. See you later. Nice you. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye. So that brings us to an end of episode thirty-six with my friend Dr. Alice Horton. Links to all the things we discussed are in the podcast notes. You've been listening to Are You a Scuba Diver? Fancy a brief podcast with me, Andy the Northern Diver. You can find more scuba-related content on my YouTube channel, and the link is in the podcast notes. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review. And to become a patron of the podcast, then visit www.patreon.com forward slash Brew. There you'll see all the different levels of subscription and how to join the Fancy Brew community. If there's someone or something you'd like us to discuss, then let us know via our Facebook page. Thanks for listening. See you on the next one.